Molo Sanbonani, hello, how's it? Welcome to the Big Daddy Liberty Show. Good evening and hello, hello to everybody. I hope you've had a fantastic uh, week so far. It is a Wednesday night, 8 p.m. You know what that means. It means your favorite fat boy, Big Daddy Liberty, is on your screens again. Guys, welcome to the show. I'm just going to give it a moment or so just to allow people uh, to join the stream and just for me to make sure that the live chat window is working. I always sort of have an issue with it. Ah, there it is. I think it's working. Guys, welcome to the show. I'm going to give it a minute or so just for people to wrap up what they may have been doing and to join us. In that minute, let me maybe do a bit of housekeeping, a little bit of admin, and um, shout out to all of those of you who are now becoming Patreon subscribers on to the show. Uh, if I can just find <laughs> that window. Um, how have you guys been? Have you... Uh, have you had a good weekend? How was your weekend? Uh, show me in the comments what you all have been up to. I always, always look forward to uh, those comments. And as I said, let me just quickly shout out those of you who have become Patreon subscribers. And I can see some new faces here. Uh, Jackie Hume, uh, shout out to you for staying on. Uh, uh, Jeremy Beerman, hello, hello. Uh, Darren Lindsay, I see you. Thank you so much for your support. Barbie H., Welcome to the Liberty Bus. Uh, Darren Lindsay, I'm sorry, I've mentioned that. Um, let's see here. Uh, Jeremy Behrman, I don't know if I said anything about you. Um, but welcome to the uh, growing number of Patreon subscribers who are supporting the work that I do, who recognize the value of the Big Daddy Liberty Show. Guys, welcome to the show. Let me just double, double, make sure that everything is fine this evening. Um Y'all know, man, these commies have, have, have uh, hated this damn show, have always come after me and my feet. <laughs> so let me just make sure everything is fine. And yeah, it looks fine. And the chat window is working. Guys, I have a bumper show for you tonight. Uh, remember, the show is only about an hour, but um, and I will open it up in the last 15 minutes uh, for you to contribute and to ask questions, especially because, I, as I said, um, or as I was saying, a, two very interesting guests on the show tonight. I've got uh, Gabriel Krauser, who is a writer and analyst at the Institute of Race Relations. And of course, I've got uh, Mr. Mpiake Gamini, an analyst and writer um, at the Free Market Foundation. Two gentlemen who are absolutely, absolutely fantastic um, and very clear and lucid thinkers on many issues. Uh, tonight's issue being really what I, what I characterized on social media as being the assault, um, or the, the, the priming to assault, really, uh, institutions in uh, the education sphere. Um, what do I mean by this? Well, you, you, if you've been paying attention, you've seen the headlines, what's dominating the headlines, which the media loves, by the way, but in any event, um, racism at uh, South Africa's top elite uh, schools in the country. I'm talking schools like Bishops, uh, Durban Girls College, uh, St. Uh, something, something, where did I put that note? St. Anne's, um, Herschel Girls. These are some of the most elite um, and most expensive schools, private schools in most cases, in the country. I mean, Bishops alone, you know, you can pay nearly a quarter of a million rand per year uh, just to, to attend at that school. So these are not schools where you know, maybe ordinary people like you and I are sending kids. You know, these are the creme de la creme. But uh, seemingly, it is these schools, according to the allegations made by the kids, at these schools that are seeing the greatest amount of oppression, apparently, against the uh, quote-unquote minorities in these schools. But we'll get into all of that um, when I have the conversation with Gabriel and Umpia. Before I do any of that, I wanted to speak to you directly because you know on this show that I've spoken, I've raised the issue that what I'm doing here um, is engaging in the battle of ideas. The idea that a society at the point of crisis, at the cusp of crisis like South Africa is, it is he who injects the greatest volume of ideas into that society who will essentially sway that society in one direction or the other. Let me repeat that. The battle of ideas theory, which is it is he who at the 
point of crisis, at the at the cusp of crisis, if you will, who injects the greatest volume of ideas, whether those ideas are toxic and trash or fantastic and liberty leaning, but it is he who injects the greatest volume of those ideas who will sway the direction of that society. And essentially, this show is doing exactly that. A quick reminder is that you know the the BDL show, the various work that I do on social media, uh, what I characterize as being the air war is one component of that disseminating ideas to as many people as possible, uh, trying to get the show, this show syndicated on local radio stations across the country. Again, the idea being the air war, the, the disseminating of these ideas to as many people as possible. And of course, the ground war, the fact that I'll be taking to the country basically as of next month, um, hitting cities across the, uh, you know, across this beautiful country of ours, uh, speaking, engaging, uh, debating with people, raising and in laying the seeds in many cases of ideas, liberty-leaning ideas. How do we build a free, prosperous, and property-owning society? The idea that we, as citizens, have a God-given right to life, liberty, and property rights. All of these are the things that I'll be taking into communities across this country, from Limpopo to the Cape, from Durban to the Northern Cape. I'll be hitting as many communities as possible with the view of sharing these ideas in all communities, whether they're rural, uh, township, even the most leafiest of suburbs. Why? Because this is our country. We fight for this country. We're not going to give up without that fight, essentially. And what is this fight for? Of building that liberty-leaning, that property-earning, that free and prosperous society away from what we're seeing at the moment, which is a, a march in the direction of socialism, of politicians, individual, you, the family. So, guys, welcome to it. I had to remind you of what my mission is and why those of you who are becoming Patreon supporters what exactly you are supporting. You're supporting me in that mission in particular. Which brings me to the to nice topic, you know. Um, if I'm injecting these ideas of a liberty-leaning society, a free, prosperous, and property-earning society, I'm seeing a buffering symbol. So I'm just going to give it a second just to make sure you haven't lost me. Um... Ah, you have lost me. Okay, I think I'm back. Um, let me just double check. Yes, I can see that I'm back. Um, guys, as I was saying before that little break, uh, you know, if, if I'm arguing, um, and by the way, for those who are joining, welcome to the show. Guys, please make sure you hit the like, the like button or rather the subscribe button and that little bell notification so that you're notified every time a show comes on. Um, I was just saying before you lost me in that little... Uh, break, you know, if, if I'm saying that I'm in the battle of ideas, and surely there are ideological opponents um, who are themselves injecting their ideas, toxic as I may, be, I may believe they are, into society. And tonight we're going to have that conversation um, because, you know, I, I want you to understand exactly who your opponent is and why they're motivated for, by what they're motivated by. Um, and I'm going to use tonight's story, which is these various elite schools in this country where the students are basically penning letters to their administration, penning letters to the media, decrying the oppression, decrying the acts of racism and discrimination um, you know, that, that they allege is happening in, in these schools. And I, I want to put it to you before I come to my guest that there is an ideological underpinning behind what we're seeing in these letters. Um, there is a, an ideology, not so much a... a the content itself may very well be, be, be true. I'm, I'm not disputing that. Um, there very well may, may be cases of racism. That's not you know being prosecuted per se here. But the language being used is the dead giveaway that behind what these students are saying are what I like to call these grievance merchants, these individuals who have made it their business and their grift, if anything, to basically suggest that society is a a a um, a a a, um, a, 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 a a place if you will of various hookies that are that are determined by our identity whether it's race class or gender and I want I want you to understand something that we call cultural Marxism when we have this conversation I'm going to raise it with the guests as I'm sure they're chomping at the bit to um, 
to get involved. But th there is going to be a conversation around what is cultural Marxism and why do I always say, uh, oh, these trendy lefties or these social justice warriors, uh, social, justi social justice warrior whites or these, you know, blavity blacks. Tonight you're going to understand in greater detail why I characterize them as this and why they are our ideological opponents. Because I can tell you now, these people who hold these cultural Marxist ideas, these critical theory types ideas, are firmly opposed to the values that do make up who we are as South Africans. They're firmly opposed to the idea that we're a society of faith, a society of families, a society that pines for freedom, and a society that is uh, family orientated, as I said. They're firmly opposed to this, so we're going to have that conversation tonight. And um, maybe without further ado, because I know these gentlemen, I'm sure they're chomping, chomping, chomping at the bits uh, to, to join us on the stream. Let me welcome my guests tonight. Of course, I have Mr. Gabriel Krauser, who's from the Institute of Race Relations. He is a writer and analyst over there. Gabriel, welcome to the show. How's it, Cicela? Thank you very much for having me. Awesome, my brother. And, of course, a familiar face for those of you who watch uh, the BDL show is Umpi Yake Ikamini from the Free Market Foundation, a writer and an analyst in that part of the world. Umpi Yake, hello. Welcome to the show, brother. Umpi uh, your mic is still muted, homie. Uh, just a quick reminder. So <laughs> we didn't hear any of that. So, Umpi how are you doing, bro? So, just... <laughs> I was basically just saying hello, Sifle, hello, Gabriel, and I'm glad to be on with you guys. Brother, we're, had it, man. <laughs> we're glad to have you. Fellas, um, let's maybe hop into it. And I'm going to begin here. I'm going to begin here because I do think we need to, to lay it out and we need to lay out the ideology behind what's happening and what's driving these particular grievances, if you will, from these learners at these various schools. And we'll, we'll get to the, 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 the demands they make themselves. We'll get to that in a short mo moment. What I wanted to do is I wanted to us to begin by looking at the ideology that, that, that essentially drives uh, what we're seeing here. And I've thrown out to the viewers a few terms already, you know, cultural Marxism, um, you know, a critical theory, um, and intersectionality. But I'm sure the viewers are wondering, what are these things? Now, I can offer a definition, of course, but I want to throw it to you guys and, and, and let's have the conversation around this. But um, let me begin with you, Gabriel. Cultural Marxism, like... Uh, we, we often you often hear this being said um, in so far as describing what we're seeing right now, not only here in South Africa but in the United States by groups like uh, Black Lives Matter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what is cultural Marxism? What, what do we understand by this? So let's start out with just sort of what Marxism is. Uh, in 1848, you have a series of attempted revolutions throughout Europe. Uh, I've got to say, Europe at the time was not looking so hot in a lot of ways. There were some governments that were nominally liberal, but were not actually liberal. There was a lot of repression. There was a lot of uh, what you might now call robber baron behavior, uh, mercantilism, uh, basically situations where you've got a lot of wealth concentrated in very few hands. And there's no free market because the governments are extremely weak and easy to buy and bully. And so basically the wealthy use their wealth to buy state power. And then they use the state power to crush competition. They use state power to crush entrepreneurship. They use state power to reinforce a pattern of rent seeking without adding value. So the idea of a robber baron, the classic robber baron, is basically a guy who says he sort of owns a river and uh, and he extorts anyone who wants to row up or down that river. Uh, basically makes it a, a, an etoll situation. Um, now, the revolts were about unhappiness at a failure to, in part, uh, uh, unhappiness about a failure for working class people to be able to save up any wealth. Uh, if the working class got to own anything, it would easily be robbed from them and there'd be no police to help them out. But if a rich guy got robbed, the police would step in to help him out. And often the police would then go and torture and abuse people and put the wrong people in jail and stuff like that. This is basically a corrupt system. And so there were some revolts, but uh, not much 
came from them, those revolts were generally quashed. There was a lot of worry that, you know, we've got 1789 French Revolution happening all over again, and that didn't work out so well. Uh, so uh, some of the crushing came from the elites, and some of the crushing just came from ordinary folk who were like, uh, we don't think that the right way to get reform is through violence. So Marx comes after that and says, uh, this kind of re revolution is going to come back. And the reason he says it is he says, the, the real story to tell is that there are groups of people defined by their income. All your real interests are shared by everyone who has the same real income and same real wealth as you and opposed by everyone who has different income or different wealth to you. He said that's the reality. And the reality of all history is class warfare. Warfare between people of different income statuses and different wealth statuses. And he says, but it doesn't always play out in, revo in revolution. And part of the reason for that is that the elites, in order to reinforce their position, have introduced a bunch of what he called ideologies, a bunch of stories, that uh, they tell in order to keep the poor in their place. And so he said, religion is the opium for the masses. It's, it's through religion that the rich keep the poor in their place because instead of the poor revolting, they go and pray. It's through stories like Adam Smith's story about trade and entrepreneurship being the way to get ahead that the rich keep the poor in their place because uh, it'll never actually work, but as long as the poor think they stand a chance of having a good life, by saving, by working, by adding value to others, by living prudently, they're less likely to revolt. Um, he said you know, racial differences, he, he, he did talk about them sometimes. He thought that in particular kinds of preoccupations with being uh, a Slav or a Jew or resentment against Jews, resentment against Slavs, resentment against Aryans, resentment against Gales. They were in the, in the 19th and 1800s, uh, race was not just black and white. People thought of Anglo-Saxon as a race, Gaelic as a race, Aryan as a race, Jew as a race, uh, Slav as a race. Um, and he said these are just also just stories that people tell in order to uh, distract themselves from the real issue. And and of course, uh, there, there's, there's, there's a grain of truth to it, right? There's certainly uh, this beautiful uh, example from ancient Rome where politicians figured out that a nice way to distract people from the real issues is to sponsor the bread and circus. So you've got the Colosseum, you've got the circus, you say to the peasants, come along and we'll throw money at you, we'll throw bread at you and we'll entertain you by feeding Christians to the lions or whomever, and it's very entertaining. And they even said there's gonna be a green team, the leek greens and the blue team, and everyone chooses a team and they get excited and they riot against each other and they kind of then uh, lose their energy to 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 go for social change. So there really are ideologies like like the bread and circus of ancient Rome that 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 are designed to distract people from the real issues and are designed therefore to keep um, rent seekers in a comfy position. So so the bottom line is Marx thinks that everything's a lie excepting for your class status, and that's the true story. And you should go to war based on your class status. Okay. Now, uh, cultural Marxism can, can takes the same bookmark. basic idea, Sorry. but applies it to social identities. Sorry, I want, I want, Sorry. I want to put a so, quick bookmark yeah. on that one because you, you've actually raised the, the important uh, genesis of Marxism generally, which is essentially Marx basically arguing that, look, sociology and anthropology is best understood by understanding what he called uh, class systems, right? Um, this, this economic divide, uh, specifically economic divide between what he called the bourgeoisie, uh, those who, you know, who have the most money in society, who uh, own what he calls are the means of production, the ways of generating wealth, versus, of course, the proletariat, um, you know, those who are abused or used and don't have a say in, in culture and society. Marx definitely opens up that dialectic, if you will, or that, that uh, antagonistic relationship based on an economic relationship. Um, I, I, I want to come to you because I, I think ooh, 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 Gabriel is raising some important areas in terms of opening up where this all begins, right, to Marx and, and his thought, um, what I like to call the two douchebags, uh, Marx and Engels, um, <laughs> but that's my personal little gripe. Um, 
this class struggle, this class struggle, and I, I'm I'm sorry, Gabriel. I know I stopped you as you're about to then transition into what um, cultural Marxism will get there. But this class struggle is an important one because this is where Marx yeah, like introduces the idea that in a society, this economic divide of what I characterize as the bourgeoisie and the proletariat is an exploitative relationship of one being the oppressed and the oppressor. This is where that notion of oppressed and oppressor begins, doesn't it? Like, yeah, yeah, true, true. And, and for Marx, really, uh, this is... This is uh, this is evident because you have um, the source of all value for him is labor, and it's a, it is an idea that uh, allows him to make this claim, which which is a rational which is a rational claim if you take that as a starting point that the source of all value is labor. Mm -hmm. Of course, we now know that is not true because we now have machines that have replaced human labor and so on. But uh, it, 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 it it's not a point it's not a bad point to make. Even Adam Smith made the same point, and so. Uh, I, 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 from there, I think uh, Gabriel outlined everything very uh, outlined the history and the definitions very well, mm. and I think from there you can sort of see the jump between where you uh, where you sort of uh, have have this oppressor oppressed relationship. Then you jump that to, you jump that to cultural institutions. Mm -hmm. So you move from the material to the, from the economic, and then you go to cultural institutions because these are the institutions that are that sustain the oppression. Now it's no longer just based on your income or your wealth. It's these specific institutions that are uh, they, 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 that they favor certain groups who who members of that group don't all don't all have to be wealth. They don't all have to control economic wealth. But by being members of the of the uh, privileged group. Then they have a, a better chance of, get, of getting access to resources, and so this is the idea. And uh, yeah, I think I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And I, I want to jump in here, and guys, I'll, I'll bring the both of you in now because I want to just move us along. Uh, we don't have much time. Um, basically, I think we rightly begin at Marx. Marx then saying basically societies are divided by the, the the bourgeoisie, the elite, if you will, who are oppressing the working class, and this is an economic relationship. What he calls uh, quote unquote the class struggle. Uh, thus, all inequalities in society argues and issues that happen are boiled down to, uh, to these economic ones. Um, but Marx, I, I think you're mentioning uh, Gabriel, but I want to move it along. Was a fan of, of a philosopher Hegel, right? Uh, Hegel, who argued yeah. that history was a process, like a a, a process, if you will. A process mm. of change, mm. um, and that history is essentially improving. This is the argument that that Hegel uh, makes, the philosopher who Marx quotes a lot. Um, Marx, of course, bought mm. into some of these ideas and he rejected others. Uh, and in rejecting them, he created his own set or his own version, where he argued that these, uh, excuse me, that things are coming to a kind of conclusion. He, his view of history is that things are coming to a, a form of conclusion. Yeah. For Marx, this meant that things would lead to a new form, a, a new kind of state, if you will, what we now understand as communism. Um, therefore, in Marx's view, as history progressed, um, you know, shouting out uh, Hegel, as history progressed, he saw it as inevitable uh, that there would be a socialist revolution as the gateway to communism. Now, we know, guys, how this played out in history, um, you know, especially in the 20th century, with the various countries, uh, including most parts of independent Africa as they gained independence, China, uh, Cuba, and the Soviet Union. We, we know what that socialist revolution looked like with a body count of 100 million people murdered, uh, starved to death, or killed in various camps. We know... Um, that has largely been a, fa a failure, if you will, in that experiment, which brings us to cultural Marxism, which actually brings us to cultural Marxism, where you then have these academics, uh, it always is the academics, isn't it? Um, recognizing the failure of, yeah. of that classical Marxism, um, and who, at what was the Frankfurt School of Thought, basically, was known as the Frankfurt, Frankfurt School of Thought, uh, 1923, a whole bunch of guys get together at what's called the Institute of Social Research, um, and they gave birth to this critical theory. Um, now, critical theory broadly, and again, I'll bring it back to you guys just now, it's kind of hard to define it, isn't it? Um, because if you actually read the originator's works in this regard, even they kind of struggle to, to define it. But broadly, just for the sake of the viewers, critical theory, and these are the ideas, by the way, that underpin um, you know what we're seeing so uh, currently in society. Critical theory is a theory of essentially all things, uh, or of 
or of all reality that is critical, um, or at least that's their intention. Uh, you know, they're critical of example for, excuse me, they're critical of uh, things like capitalism, Western thought, uh, and, and the historic world as we understand it. Um, now, with, with these guys at this Frankfurt School getting together and formulating this critical theory, um, uh, the, the ideas of Karl Marx were then adopted and expanded to relate to all areas of thought, as Mpiaki was raising. Um, so where Marx thought, for example, that social relations were economic, in other words, a relationship between um, the, the bourgeoisie, the elite, and the proletariat, or the working class, where, where Marx thought they were only economic, um, critical theory, and these guys from the Frankfurt, Frankfurt School, applied that dialectic um, or that narrative uh, of, of an oppressed grouping, sorry, versus an oppressor to all sorts of areas such as race, class, and gender. Now, these three are the oft-used um, categories of, of this new cultural Marxism that we're seeing, a cultural Marxism which now defines the ideas that you and me are fighting uh, today, where the oppressed versus the oppressor is still the relationship they argue is in existence, but they apply it to things like race, class, and gender. Now, things under this, um, in, things like individual thought and action become irrelevant to people who hold these ideas. It is now your race, your class, and your gender that are your identity. And depending on the hierarchy of oppressed versus oppressor, your identity intersects. In other words, it, it meets at certain points. And these are what they argue determine whether you are an oppressor or the oppressed in society. These are who broadly, when I talk about the woke people or the blavity blacks or the social justice whites and the identitarians, people who trade in identity, these are literally the basket of ideas that they hold to. And broadly speaking, people who are modelled by, um, you know, these grievance, uh, the, I call them grievance merchants, because suddenly now all grievances are viewed through the lens of either I'm oppressed or I'm an oppressor based on my identity. So I just had to chart that uh, course, guys, so we can get straight into the meat and potatoes of it, of in terms of who and what guides the ideas of my ideological opponents. Um, so let me get straight into it. Um, you know, when we then look at the, 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 the letters uh, from these kids, Biake and uh, Gabriel, you can almost see the language of these grievance merchants coming through, almost like a, a puppet, mm. um, you know, a sock puppet, puppet, to an extent, where they hit all the, the, yeah. the, the areas of what I call the narrative of the cultural Marxist, which is race, class, and, uh, and, and, uh, and gender. Um, and you can almost see simultaneously, as they, they appropriate this identity politics in their letter, in their demands to these schools, that there is a, an attempt for them to destroy the traditional institutions, i.e. to be critical of them, i.e. critical theory, um, in favour of creating these new paradigms that are based on race, um, class, and, and gender. Now, as I say this, let, let me actually go into some of these demands, and I'm going to put it to you guys just for us to discuss these things. Um, I'm going to use bishops <clears throat> as an example, because they literally were the one that, that made the news the most, I suppose, where they pen a letter, and in this letter they make a, a, a series of, what's it, 20, 20 demands as the metric class of 2020. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to read all of them. I'm just going to go to the ones which I think um, exposed, that, that gave away the game that they're actually being um, sort of, you know, uh, shoved or pushed out through the lens of the, the cultural Marxism and critical theory. Now, demand number... Um, uh, excuse me. Demand number two. Demand number two. We demand that there be compulsory discussions and presentations for new grade eights about the oppression of minority and vulnerable groups. These should be handled by external bodies and not done in-house. Now, yeah, okay. for me, this was a big alarm bell because I don't mm. understand how in a country where over 80% of the population is black, they can argue, for instance, that there is an oppression of minority and vulnerable groups in a school uh, in South Africa. C can you maybe try and decipher this? Where is this going? Well, it seems to me from reading their, their, their list of demands, that's what they are saying is that uh, there is some oppression that is being faced by people of color based on uh, uh, institutions that were created during periods when the intention was to oppress people of color. 
And so those institutions still have their original mandates and the people who are part of these institutions are automatically co-opted into furthering this goal. And so it, it, it's it, it's a point worth arguing. Where I differ with them is this demand that they, they, they should be... Um, we, we, we should we should lecture great aids for example on the or on the oppression of people of, of minorities and people and people of color and so on you don't you you don't you you, you you can't do that you have to discuss it you have to you have to determine if there's any oppression first and secondly like in in the modern era this is the institution that is built on voluntary principles yes as much as it exists a point where this uh, debating then but let's also not be dishonest like everyone who is involved in the school Came, came to the school by choice, like whether you signed an employment contract, whether you were a past student alumni, or whether you're a current student, or whether you're a parent to a student, or whether you belong to the governing body. All of these various people uh, are associated with the school by, by, their, by their own choice, and they make decisions in the present about which policies the schools should adopt. So yes, the history is important because it's, it sort of influences these people making decisions in real time now. But the school itself is based on a set of ideas or, or principles that can be teased out based on, on based on what the school conducts its learning and teaching. So these things are not are not impossible to perceive. So we can actually find out if the school is racist, for example, are, are they are they in, in their curriculum? Are they encouraging debates among students, or are they, for example, uh, mal maligning other uh, uh, students of uh, or, 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 um, uh, students of different colors? Uh, are they uh, is the school uh, allowing tolerating racist uh, assaults, for example, things like that. Is the school allowing free expression or, or, or discussion about race, which is another important thing because you need you need discussion about race in order to end racism. You need to be to discuss race and and be able to discuss it freely and even joke about it. And so by by shutting down debate in this very um, strong handed uh, strong armed way, I don't think where they will, it will go where they think they where they think they want it to go. Mm. Gabriel Umpiaki mentions a very important place, uh, a very a very important point. Sorry, that if you're going to argue that, that there is a, a a culture of racism, that you would therefore want, if anything, an open uh, approach to how you deal with it. Right, um, that you'd want, for example. Um, or at least how I see it, you would want to create institutions, not personalities, not vested interest groups, but actual institutions that are impartial, that can deal and arbitrate these issues um, through you know, logical, rational ways, uh, investigating a claim, for example, as opposed to just assuming that there is a, an inherent culture um, based on one being an oppressor and there being a... a, 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 a um, rather, a relationship between oppressors and the oppressed. Um, but when I then read demand yeah. number eight, and I want you to jump in on this one, when I read number de demand number eight, um, we demand a separate, diverse disciplinary committee which deals with issues pertaining to the oppression of minority and uh, vulnerable groups. This should not be done in-house to avoid cover-ups. To me, it, it seems though the students are asking for a special dis dispensation for a special grouping of people, almost like separate rules for separate people based on this dialectic yeah. of oppressed versus oppressor. Do you want to chime in on this? Am I reading it wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It's, it is hard to say. Um, I think based, I've, I've read the whole document. You read the whole document and, and, and one does certainly get an impression. But let's focus on minority, the word minority. And let's go back to Marx for a second. So as Mpiaki said, one of the bizarre things about Marx is that although he spent his life writing about the economy, he didn't understand the first thing about the economy, namely that human hands and human brains aren't the only things that add value, machines also add value, right? Marx was writing in the thick of the second industrial revolution. So it's not like machines weren't around. He was just ignoring fundamental facts. Farms also had already been around with cows and mules and donkeys and all of these things adding value. So Marx's problem is that he looks at the outcomes and he doesn't look at the process. He doesn't look at how the economy actually works. He just sees the outcome is some people are rich, some people are poor, therefore it's bad. Difference in outcomes equals bad, never mind what's going on in the process. Now, similarly, cultural Marxists look at differences in outcomes. Now, let's just say one difference in outcome is sort of uh, how many people of a certain type are in the room and how many people of another type are in the room. And it's from this that you get minorities, right? So if there's a minority, you can say automatically that there's a problem. Uh, this seems to be part of their idea. 
Uh, now, one of the really ironic things here is that minorities, speaking about minority groups, this is, a, this is an American language where minorities in America and persons of color in America co-refer. Persons of color are a minority in America, and therefore when you talk about minority groups, you end up talking about persons of color. In South Africa, as you say, persons of color are the majority group. So on one reading of their demand, uh, you know, it, it would just be whites, Indians, coloreds, and, 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 Ch and Chinese people that need special protection at bishops. Uh, because those are the minority groups in this country by race. Uh, but of course, that's not what they mean. You can tell that's not what they mean by reading the rest of the document. So the other way of interpreting is, well, within a class or within the, the whole school, what racial group is the minority? And so whether it's the majority outside of the country, ignore that. If it's the minority here, then that's the group that needs special protection. But again, just the fact that there's sort of more of one kind of person and less of another kind of person doesn't itself mean that there is an injustice any more than just the fact that there are some rich people and there are some poor people automatically means there's an injustice. You've got to look at how the sausage is made. You can't just look at it sort of once it's packaged and it's already in the store. And so uh, in terms of their call to, I don't know, have a look at how the sausage is made, if you really bend over and, and twist through the words to try and see that as being what they want, uh, is it the case, uh, if you interpret them as asking, is it the case that people are being discriminated on, on the basis of race? If it's that case, then we want someone to investigate that and arbitrate that. Then that's perfectly reasonable. But it doesn't seem like what they're looking for is, is, is an investigation of the process. It seems to me rather like what they're looking for is an investigation of an outcome. Uh, as long as there are fewer black kids at bishops than there are white kids, then there must be some kind of injustice, and we need an external body to investigate this injustice on an ongoing basis. That just sounds like a program for 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 undermining agency, for undermining responsibility, for undermining learning, mm. and 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 clear evidence based critical thinking. Mm. Uh, and 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 that's extremely unfortunate. Now, I want to say another thing about the sort of uh, allegations of racism coming from elite private schools. Uh, I think that you've got to be wary about um, allegations of racism are very serious. Racism is a very bad thing. And like all serious allegations, the first thing that happens is the allegation. The second thing that should happen is an investigation. And that investigation should be dispassionate. It should not assume that the allegation is true on the basis of anyone's race, nor should it assume that the allegation is groundless on the basis of anyone's race. And, and it should then pursue, uh, you know, interrogating witnesses, asking people to come forward, explain what's going on, explain multiple interpretations of the same event, and then come to a deliberative conclusion. Now, that's not often what happens. Uh, for an example, from when I was at school, one of my contemporaries at school, I was at St. Stethian's Boys College, one of the elite schools in Johannesburg, at the same time that Cesar and Porfu Walsh was at St. John's Boys College. Uh, some of your listeners, and Piaki, I'm sure, will know who Cesar and Porfu Walsh is. He has sort of become a uh, cause celebre among yeah. uh, woke South Africans. And I read his book, uh, and, and one of the chapters in that book is dedicated to explaining how terribly he suffered racism at St. John's. Now, the reason he says he suffered racism at St. John's terribly, at St. John's terribly, was on the basis of the fact that when he was a prefect, some boy who was a bit younger, let's say a grade 10, uh, had wanted lunch, even though the lunch cafeteria was officially closed. And I know the feeling. I was a boarder at St. Stidians, and one often arrived a bit late, and you're supposed to plan ahead and write a letter, but he didn't, you know, put in the script, the permit. So you go and beg the kitchen staff for a bit of food. And sometimes they say yes, and sometimes they say no, depending on how they feel, how you feel, how well you present yourself and so on. They said no to this guy. Presumably he had a bit of a history of not filling in the form. And they were like, you know, you're gonna, you have to learn your lesson here, guy. You know, like there's a, there's a structure to this thing. You've got to stick to the structure. And he threw a fit. And they said, you know, you can have fruit and bread. And he ate a banana and then threw the banana peel at the staff member. Now, I, I think that's very bad behavior. If I had done that when I was at school, I would expect to get a headmaster's detention. 
I would expect maybe, and a headmaster's attention goes with a letter to your parents explaining the nature of your conduct and insisting that you behave yourself. I mean, that's just bloody rude. That's disrespectful. Yeah. To, especially to someone whose job it is to, to prepare and serve you food. So very, you know, I, I, uh, people deserve respect. You're adding value to your life. And that's a real value add there. Um, but now, the claim was that because it was a banana that he threw at the staff member, this was not just rude, this was racist. This is, uh, <laughs> I don't know. This, this is a real stretch. Um, More than a stretch. Now, they called in the parents, they called in the staff, they had a meeting about it, they had a, they had a discussion, a disciplinary hearing, and Cesar was part of the disciplinary hearing, and this kid said, I threw the banana, it had nothing to do with the person's race, it had to do with the fact that that was the only food available to me, and I didn't want to have that food, and I wanted meat, and I didn't feel like a banana, so I threw the banana. But, they, but his insistence was, Cesar's insistence was, no, this is racist, and when the kid didn't get sort of drawn and courted for racism, uh, he concluded, therefore, St. John's is a racially oppressive organization. This is, this is crazy. And, it's, and, and I think in, in America, we've had another very good example of this just today, where uh, the White House um, uh, spokesperson says, uh, you know, I can't believe that there's Congress uh, women calling for defunding the police like, then she mentions one, and then she says, uh, and, and AOC, and th who's a Biden advisor as well. And then Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez says on Twitter, you know, uh, it's typical racism not to refer to me as a congresswoman, but rather to refer to me as a helper to Biden. When in fact, she was literally referred to as a congresswoman. But she's got this racist stereotype in her head that white people treat persons of color in this way. And then even if the evidence doesn't line up, if there's like the vaguest chance to grab onto it, she gets to present herself as a victim in this cultural Marxist hierarchy. Uh, being the, the, the biggest victim makes you the most virtuous. Mm. So that pushes her kudos up. That pushes her ability to get likes, money, power up. And, and so the facts be damned, she's going to insist that she was abused in a racist way. I think that when I was at school, I can speak from personal experience. There was some of that. There were definitely stupid white oaks who said, you know, I feel like, uh, like, 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 like dudes are being very racist towards me when they uh, don't uh, tell jokes that I can understand because the punchline is not in English. This is crazy. Uh, and there were definitely stupid black guys who were like, no, this guy's being racist to me because he's making reference to uh, an Oscar Wilde story and I didn't grow up with Oscar Wilde on my parents' library's bookshelf and therefore he's oppressing me. And teachers, when I was at school, did a very good and careful job of trying to pass apart the real racism. And we did have some real racism at school and from the, from the, from the grievance merchancy, sort of the, the school level uh, gre uh, 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 grievance merchism. And I think that uh, at St. John's, even then, it wasn't, it was clearly the case that they, that they weren't uh, bowing down before uh, the claim that any time throws a banana peel at someone else, mm. they're being a racist. But I think that times have changed, right? There've been a change of the God. None of the schools when I was, none of those private schools when I was in matric 2007 have the same headmasters uh, today. And uh, they're not operating in the same South African climate. They're not, back then, it was kind of laughable when Jacob Zuma said that uh, it was racist to call him corrupt. But over time, it became normal to echo this message that it's racist to criticize Zuma as corrupt. Mm. It became normal to criticize people as racist for defending property rights. It, it became normal uh, for, for EFF leaders to describe black individuals who don't believe in socialism as house N-word and so on. And as that has normalized in society, I think private schools have struggled increasingly to maintain their ethos of character content before race, before class, before anything else. And um, partly it's for them to pursue money, partly for them it's just to stick to the fashion, you know. And but, I think that the I, I incidents... Because of, of George Floyd's murder has really blown 
blown the whole thing up. And so you see a new wave, but it's not Before the any of that, um, it, it, I must interject because you've, you actually raised a critically important thing that I don't want us to gloss over, which is this idea that there are vested interest groups in our society who trade on race and seek to play off people um, off on these various race groupings that they're appropriate for themselves. And as you rightly mentioned, that there are some who then, because they belong to a certain, um, by, by accident of their birth, have a certain uh, melanin type, will then say, oh, this, this makes me a perpetual victim. And because of this victim mm -hmm. status that I appropriate to myself, um, I have the right to be able to call on or uh, criticize someone else, again, for something that they have no, no control over. Like, for instance, you are a white, and I use the word inverted commas because I hate describing people as white and black. Um, to me, those descriptors are meaningless to a large extent, but fine. For the sake of this conversation, let me use it. You're a white South African. Go ahead. Now, <laughs> in, in today's Ow. South Africa, <laughs> in today's South Africa, we're meant to view each other with great distrust, if you were to listen to the those who advocate these ideas at least, because I, by virtue of me having brown skin, am a perpetual victim of it, right? I'm, I, I, I suffer institutional racism, as they'll call it, um, which I've argued at the beginning of the segment is what they're trying to attack. They're trying to attack the institutions in society that generally speaking, especially in a democratic dispensation like ours, protect all people regardless of their creed, regardless of their race, regardless of their gender. They're trying to attack those institutions because those institutions don't speak the language of what they want, which is a society of yeah. blacks as victims, whites as oppressors, um, uh, males as patriarchal, no, Cicle, evil, Cicle, Cicle, Cicle. and, and Please, women uh, as, as can victims. Can I jump in here? I wanna, I wanna very briefly, because I want to go to Mpiak. I must, I must bring in Mpiak. Okay. Let me make a very short point. It's not just about attacking institutions. Where superficially, it looks like saying all blacks are victims. If I was black and I was saying that, that's putting myself down. But what comes with that is that you must believe me whatever I say. Yes. So although in one sense I'm putting myself down, I'm also giving myself a tremendous power if everyone takes my word at it. Now for white oaks, there's a similar thing. It might seem like, oh, you say, oh, whites are terrible, they're oppressors. It's like putting yourself down. But the very same white guys who do that take pride in their own whiteness mm -hmm. because they see whiteness as being the race that is the most humble, the most groveling, the most apologetic. And that too has a kind of power and it's a power that you can turn into money. It's a power that you can turn into political power as well. So at the superficial level, it seems to be kind of self-denigrating. But if you just peel back one layer, you see that it often ends up being a way of saying, I, based on my race, am actually a superior being to what I would otherwise be. And that is true for both the sort of white woke camp and for the black woke camp, Absolutely. in my opinion. Yeah, okay. we, we get the, we, we're on the receiving end of this quite a lot, aren't we? Where you deal with these these individuals who trade on race, these, these identity merchants, uh, these identitarians rather, who trade on race and then see themselves as the gatekeepers of all things related to that race. Uh, things that they determine, by the way, are related to that race. For instance, someone like you uh, and me would be called house niggers, or uh, again, I, I, I've been called this before, and excuse you know, uh, the sensitivity of my listeners, but I've been called a kava by, by individuals who are black, believe it or not. Why? Because the argument is, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kissing up to white individuals in my ideas. Um, there, there is a, a big emphasis in Piake on denigrating and maligning those who don't agree with the orthodoxy of either the blavity black groups who control black people or blackness, as they call it, and the social justice whites, the, the self-flagellating whites, uh, as U U U Gabriel uh, rightly describes them who see themselves as being virtuous because they can denigrate their, their skin color on behalf of the oppressed in society. Um, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. I agree with Gabriel as well. I think you definitely see this. And uh, uh, it's quite ironic that these individuals feel that they can uh, denigrate other black people like this. It reminds me of the George, George Floyd incident, in fact, when now consider how many black people have been killed now uh, since this protest started, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, black people killed uh, either defending their property or getting in the way of these uh, individuals who are looting. And so this is, uh, we need to be clear about what we are talking about. If we are for uh, black people, then 
we must be rational and go all in on it. Like we must actually find out what will make what would make life better for black people. For black people. I mean, I, I often say that the rational um, uh, Af African nationalist or socialist or wokeist or whoever, or if if you if you really if you really care about the issues you claim you care about then you will eventually come to some form of liberalism it might not be my liberalism but you might you 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 you'll, you'll have an appreciation for some property rights and i think uh, maybe you might have welfare or something like that but you you will have a, like you because you understand that without property rights you can't create the prosperity that you seek for the individuals that are currently um, suffering in society the people that you care about and so uh, until we can have that conversation the rational conversation uh, it, it seems to me that it's not even worth engaging because we, we, are, we are simply trading insults. If we want to engage uh, at the level of oh, let's find a solution, then let's go. But then if we if we are just trading insults, there's no point. And guys, just a reminder, um, at the at nine o'clock, I'm going to open it up to the, the viewers for questions and the like uh, for 30 minutes because the show is always an hour and a half. Uh, the, the last 30 minutes, just opening it up to questions. But maybe as my last two questions that I want us to speak about, because I, I think we've established um, broadly uh, the various vested interest groups and why some people have a, a, a desire to, to preserve the idea that there is a, a, a relationship in society of the oppressed and oppressors. And from that position... They can argue that their, their position of being oppressed comes with certain virtues, right? Certain things that they can say or do that others can't say or do, purely based on arbitrary things like your race, your gender, and your class. Now, I, I want to put it to you guys because um, what I said on, on social media, and I, I want to test you guys on it, not test you, but like I want to see your views, is I'm of the view... <clears throat> that those who trade in race, those who trade in class, those who trade in gender, broadly these grievance merchants, if you will, actually have a fundamental issue with the creation of institutions in society which are meant to create true equality. The idea that regardless of who or what you are, um, before certain institutions, like the law, um, there should be equality in that regard. I'm of the view that these individuals are actually opposed to that. They're deeply opposed to that because it doesn't reinforce the narrative they're pushing, which is there's some groups who are oppressed, are oppressed and deserve special dispensations, special rules for them. And there are some groups who are historically and currently oppressors who deserve some form of special punishment. Um, so if you're a white, uh, straight male, uh, you're seen as oppressor number one on their hierarchy of race, uh, class, and, and gender victimhood. And you should deserve all forms of punishment, which are seen as being right and virtuous, by the way, in how they frame things. So what I want to put to you guys, because I, I said on social media that these individuals, because of this view, are seeking to attack key institutions that actually socialize us as, as people, as individuals. Um, the family, for example. That fundamentally, this assault is not just about aimed at these schools, but actually is aimed at the families that send their kids to these schools to a large extent. For instance, suddenly you being a, a Muslim, devout Muslim household that sends your kid to the school will come under attack because the, the values you impart based on your faith to your kid may conflict with the, the identitarian grievance merchants. If you are a Christian, I mean, a lot of these schools are Christian schools, to be specific, um, and the institutions that are drawn from our values, uh, or those values, sorry, in the Christian school, Equally, I mean, I live around a whole bunch of yeshivas around here. Um, in fact, one of the biggest yeshiva colleges is down the road from me. Um, <clears throat> a Jewish school and the certain values that we derive from our faith. That in reality, what these individuals, these, uh, you know, the blabdy blacks and the social justice whites are actually after is the destruction of these institutions that socialize people that they argue and they often use in throwaway terms are racist or sexist, they'll say. Guys, your thoughts on this, Mbiake? Yes, uh, that, that's uh, yeah, that's uh, it, it's unfortunate because this is you can see clearly this is what is happening because like it's no coincidence in as much as this there the, is a psychological aspect to this you there is there is no coincidence that these people always go after the same institutions they always point out the same problems poverty is always analyzed against uh, against the same matrix using uh, using the same uh, Marxist analysis, they, they I mean, they, 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 uh, they include uh, social and cultural issues, but uh, at the core, they still that material analysis that Marx developed. 
So if you if if everyone is 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 that is pointing out the problem is offering the same solution, I think you should be suspicious at least, and you should ask more questions because you it, it it's not possible that everyone would think exactly in the same way, would see the problem the same way. And so let's have a discussion. I'm all for a discussion. Like I'm I'm willing to go into it not having any preconceived notions. I am willing to go into it uh, accepting that I'm, I may be shown to be wrong in what I believe. And so this is this is the debate we need to have. I mean, when it comes to the institutions, I, said, like, I, I, I look at a statement by bishops where they, where they release a statement saying basically owning up to, the, to having a, a structures, an institution built, built on structures of oppression. Now, what is this saying about the values that they've, they have been preaching to their students all these past years? They, are, are they now completely abandoned? Are, are they saying that we've been teaching you the wrong values? Are they saying you are, are they saying that your education is now worthless because we didn't we, we we didn't do what we said we were doing? And so this is these are hard questions, and you can't just throw away institutions. I mean, institutions are a reality. It's how people express their preference, their ideas about how things should go, how how education should be served to 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 their children and so on. And so this. If you attack those ideas, you are attack. You are really attacking individual preferences. You are attacking individuals' right to have their own set of ideas about how to conduct their lives. Because institutions, if, if we are completely realistic, are the only way to be truly free of government. Because as as one as one individual, it it is it is right and proper that you should have all your rights. But in in, in realistic terms, like acting alone, you can uh, you can only accomplish so much. That's why, like you know, you, you can't really say, for example, something like welfare. If you say I oppose welfare, then you can also oppose the groups uh, that, that uh, offer charity to individuals and so on and so on. So yeah. Uh, before I come to you, Gabriel, because I think I can raise something. I want to I want to not forget. I do feel as though that is perhaps the end game. That in in all their pontificating about being the people who are championing diversity and championing uh, uh, you know um, all the, the various values in whatever guise they take, in reality they actually oppose um, the diversity insofar as things that they don't agree with. So for instance, um, I've always argued that these individuals are, are almost a bit like a cult in a way. They're, they're creating their own religion around this wokeness, if you will, where the, the, the demands then and the attitude and the behavior they, ex they exhibit is the attempt to control and to manipulate and to bend to their will all institutions, all uh, spheres that, that disagree or rather don't hold their particular view. So somewhere like bishops, for example, you made a good example, now issuing a letter saying, you know, yes, they have these structures that, that um, you know, I, I want to I poorly paraphrase you, but then it, it begs the question, can a parent who maybe holds certain values, like Christian values, for instance, um, not have the freedom, the liberty, if you will, to seek out a school that echoes that value? Can a parent who has a different set of values, maybe even the work type values, um, seek out a school that exhibits those values? Um, and teaches those values. Is it not diversity to actually have different schools that cater for these different palettes, if you will, yeah. um, of our values? And why then do we see these lefties in particular try and destroy that freedom by basically saying, no, 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 all schools need to follow our guidelines, our what we've determined as being, um, you know, based on race, gender, and class, uh, the, the ideal society. So uh, I well, what is yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. I, I just wanted to start off by quoting the exact quotes. The school's management said, we acknowledge that due to this systemic and structural racism contained within the foundation of our school, and because schools such as ours are microcosms of society, uh, SES has not always been a safe space for our students who are people of color, past and present. Wow. So uh, this, this is... This is this is unfortunate to me, uh, and this, uh, I made a mistake. It's not actually Bishop. It's Saint Cyprian's. Yeah, but this is this is disturbing because they are basically saying the Christian values that we were founded on uh, are contain this structure of racism. And I, 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 I would personally find that offensive as a Christian. But I don't know that. So I, I guess it doesn't matter. Of, it, it doesn't matter offending the Christians, but as long as you don't offend this edifice that they, they all agree on. Gabriel, let me come to you. These guys become a bit of a cult in and of themselves where you have to bend the knee to them. If you don't, then you face their wrath. Uh, yeah? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, so in a way, I want to join Piaki in saying, like, I don't mind cults per se. I don't mind expressions of individual yeah. preference per se. And, and and if some people want to make a school that's super woke and like every play that the school does has to be perfectly racially and gender representative. And if they play rugby, then, you know, within the forwards, there's eight people in the forward pack. One of those people has to be white. One has to be colored. One has to be Indian. And the rest have to be black. In the back line, you have the same thing. If they want to play rugby that way, I don't know, man. Knock Worst yourselves out. Worst team ever. <laughs> no, but it's fine. It's like they're not going to win, but maybe they'll enjoy themselves. Um, but but my beef is with bringing down other institutions rather than Absolutely. building up your own. So and 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 fallism. I mean, I said we've had waves of this before. Fallism at the universities in this country was a very clear wave of that. And fallism, you know, is embodied. It was a movement that carried on over years. Burned down many many things. Libraries nearly killed security guards. Ruined a lot of uh, people's uh, uh, times. Um, but it started with removing the statue of Cecil John Rhodes. I can't understand why my idea, when I first heard about fallism at UCT in 2008, and other people's ideas, including Albie Sachs, who lost his arm in this, you know, essentially fighting for justice, became a constitutional court justice, great struggle hero, so on. The idea that rather than take the statue down, you should put something up, either a plaque to contextualize it, or even better, I said, the statue of Nelson Mandela next to Cecil John Rhodes. And Rhodes is sitting, Mandela can be standing, he can be taller, he can be more amazing. Uh, you know, knock yourself out, get the best artist you want to do it. Um, and 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 both of them wouldn't mind it in the sense that they had their names conjoined in the Mandela Rhodes Scholarship at, at UCT. But these guys are not into building. And I think that's the point you keep saying, Cecilia, is that winning is not winning to them, right? Yeah. If they were to make a rugby team in this in the style that I just designed, and they were to lose, as Mpiaki suggested they would, and I think he's 100% <laughs> right, that would not be bad. That would then be the opportunity for them to uh, get together and and lash themselves and cry out about how the referee was not being fair, right? These guys have t have taken this thing and and and. I do like referring to the esteem economy as distinct from the power and, and property economies because it's got this special feature. I think those are the three kinds of basic, basic social goods that people go for, power, property, and the positive regard of others. But the special thing about the positive regard of others is that you, you can have a shape, right, of like um, – a structure of a team or an idea like feminine beauty, and then you can – the, the, the ideal man, uh, the ideal wor worker, the ideal uh, virtuous person. And you can fill the content of that idea in, in opposite ways. So on one day, to be the most beautiful woman, according to a community, uh, she's going to look like this. A few years later, it can look exactly the opposite. On one day, being the most virtuous person can mean being the one who adds the most value to others. The next day, being the most virtuous person can be the one who suffered the most unjust oppression. Uh, and so if what you're really going for in your life is first and foremost to get esteem, not by way of honor, not by way of, as you say, injecting good ideas, but just to serve your own ego, then you can be very creative in the ways that you that you that you service that, and being destructive of others, and 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 turning whatever backlash you get into more fuel to your victimization narrative, is 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 a self perpetuating cycle that keeps you floating. And I think that this critical race theory, uh, cultural Marx. Uh, uh, ideas that started bubbling through from the 1880s in America have continued to bring success to grievance merchants because the grievance merchants breed more grievance, which then does well for themselves and and poorly for everyone else. It's it's a very clever game if if you if you put morality to the side. I, th I think they're extremely successful, very innovative people. No, I agree. And guys, with that being said, I must open it up to uh, the viewers. Guys, if you have any questions that you want to get to either U, U Gabriel or Umbiake, please uh, jot them down here in the comment section and I'll, I'll keep an eye on them and, and put them to the guests. Um, 
But it must be said, maybe as my, my final thought, that my concern is th these are not individuals who are pining for freedoms. These are not individuals who are pining for a truly diverse society where if you hold certain ideas and, by God, you want to uh, enact them and create something that, that reflects them, go ahead, you know, do your thing. These are, they're not those people. These are people who basically, yeah. through the use of force and through the use of coercion and through the use of violence, and you're right, when uh, uh, Gabriel, to point out the likes of fees must fall and roads must fall, because that's exactly what we saw um, with, with that fallist... Uh, you know, trendy lefty nonsense, which is the use of violence to coerce, to shut down free thought, to shut down debate, and worse yet, because of how they view society through the prism of different races, different genders, to then be the, the, the self-appointed police of all things black or all things uh, women or gender, whatever the yeah. case may be. That is the most dangerous part of it, is the policing of, of those who fall within these groups, so to speak, <clears throat> but may have a different uh, thought. Let me just see if there's any questions here. Um, Kerry van Skalkweg, uh, more of a philosophical one, is there a difference between socialism and communism? Um, Kerry, I'm going to hold on to that question. Let me see if there's any others, because these tend to flow, <laughs> fly by quite quickly. Uh, I don't want to miss any. Question from Dylan Thatcher. In the last three years, my old school has got incredibly work, making students sign a Me Too manifesto and so forth uh, for kids as young as 13. Do you think this uh, this thinking will create more tolerance or less? Um, Biaki, let me start with you. I, I, it, will, it will become less tolerant. I think it's obvious from the trend we've been seeing, um, especially in South Africa. I think South Africa is the, is the perfect test case of what the rest of the world is sort of experiencing. I think we are far ahead in, 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 term, in, in, in the, of the rest of the world. Like we've been dealing with these issues for a long time now. This victimhood narrative that's been, that's been pushed by politicians especially. And uh, victimhood as current in South Africa has, ha has had a long history. Mm. And so as long as people are willing to be, um, in a sense, uh, uh, like Gabriel was mentioning now, in order to sort of uh, get this unend, unend ex esteem, selling, selling, selling their power to politicians in order to get this unearned esteem, then uh, I think we'll become in le less and less tolerant. I think because the government has, has the biggest paycheck, and so a lot of these um, uh, uh, institutions and all uh, institutions rely on government, and even if they don't rely on government, government has the power to regulate this. And so you've already seen like you know, uh, people like uh, Batabi Lezamini uh, making hints of this, uh, complaining about private schools. And so as if as if uh, that's another thing by the way we're discussing this where we have spent so much time discussing this meanwhile in schools children are literally down, drowning in toilets uh, teachers are being killed by students uh, students are killing each other and and students don't have books to read they have to share like uh, classrooms are overflowing yeah. Can you believe what? I mean, it's as if we don't have real problems. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I must throw yeah. it to you, Gabriel. The, the question, just again, uh, do you think that the workness, do you think it's creating uh, more tolerance or less? And as, you say, as I say that, one has to remember that tolerance is a key liberal value. The idea that, you know, we're different yeah. uh, in society. And by, by virtue of that difference, we tolerate each other. We're not trying to bend each other to each other's will uh, using force. Yeah. Uh, Gabe's? Yeah, so I think that um, uh, terms of engagement for a debate are are very important. So, for example, you want me to sort of distinguish between socialism and communism? I can say it's the difference between dumb and dumber. Uh, now, I happen to basically believe that, but if I am to debate with a socialist or a communist, and I've debated with a communist on your show, Sitle, yeah. I will. I won't say a thing like that because it doesn't help the debate. And I learned some things from that engagement, and he learned some things from that engagement <laughs> uh, because the terms of the engagement was not to check the identity of the person, how he self-identifies ideologically, and therefore to accord truth values, but rather to listen, look at the arguments, line them up with the facts on the ground, line them up with the inferential calculus of logic, and line them up with some axiomatic principles of, of, of morality. And yeah. then to and then to see what you can do. That's what real engagement is. Now, I don't say we always have to engage in a serious way. Sometimes we can make a little bit of a joke, and I don't mind making the little bit of a joke that the difference between socialism and communism is a difference between dumb and and dumbest. Uh, but 
but this is but that's but I know how to switch that off, right? So these work yeah. guys, they don't know how to switch it off. <laughs> firstly. Yeah. Secondly, they're not interested in I mean, literally, I, I can I can show you papers produced at WITS, at UCT, um, and at UKZN that say, and I've had interviews with students. I used, I used to go to WITS every year, at least four times a year, to go and talk to students, go and listen to professors speak. I have heard, and I can show you papers that say the biggest problem is rationality. This is the biggest problem at WITS, the biggest problem at UCT, is there's too much focus on rationality. Rationality is a, is a white man's construct. It's white mischief to demand evidence. It's white mischief to deploy the inferential calculus. It's white mischief to talk about gravity as being yeah. a universal property. It's white mischief to talk about uh, allopathic med medicines that have been scientifically tested. This, those are, uh, breed intolerance because the terms of engagement are intolerant. Because the terms of engagement determine what role you should play according to accidents of birth and are impervious, in fact, actively resistant to engagement uh, on, on what I think are the, are the only common grounds that we can find. You know, in a weird way, we are all very strange things, born into these individual bodies that we can never leave, we can never really astral travel. We're kind of stuck in, in a sort of lonely space. Only I can really hear my inner thoughts. You can't hear them. I can't hear your inner thoughts. How do we find common ground, given the fundamentally lonely nature of a human body? We find common ground through common reference to facts, to logic, and to axioms of, of, of morality. And they scorch that common ground. It's no man's land. It's like the area between two trenches in World War I. It's riddled with corpses and maggots and shells, cavities, where things have been blown up. They don't want you to cross it. So it, it certainly brings intolerance. And you can see it. You can see it in the Institute surveys. You can see it. In, uh, in in the, in the nature that South African politics has taken, and it's very unfortunate. And I, and I must just say, talking about Mpiaki's point about real problems, you know, one of the things that I'm worried about is this idea that um, racial representation is the foremost necessity at private schools, uh, where mm. a lot of politicians are sending their children, by the way, which might be part of the reason that the influence is going through. If you look at uh, institute surveys, one of the strongest places of non-racialism we find is you ask parents, black, white, Indian, colored, do you want your parents, your kids to be taught by teachers of the same race? Or do you want your, your kids to be primarily taught by teachers that are the best at the job, regardless of the race? Mm -hmm. Now you do find some white racists who say, no, 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 primarily I want my kids to be taught by white kids. It's like 5% or whatever it is. You do find some black racists who say, no, 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 I just want black teachers to teach my kids. But 90, it's like above 90%, like the overwhelming, it's like 94, 95%, the overwhelming majority of South Africans want the best for their children. Yeah. Whatever the color, that's not what determines the best. The best is determined by the quality of the teacher, by the quality of their character, by the quality of their training. And I think that, that has been one of the last bastions in this country of liberalism, of of good values, and I think that it's being it's being eaten away at. And if you kick that stool, that that uh, leg from under the stool that we're all sitting on, like how many more legs can you kick away before uh, things get even worse than they are, even worse than forty percent unemployment, even worse than the terrible schooling system we have even worse than people being killed by the police oh man no, no accountability no, i agree yeah. um and i want to throw something to you because i'm going to wrap up just now i see the questions are sort of tapering off i do see your question dylan thatcher i'll get to it just now um my my biggest concern in addition to what we've discussed is you know you, you have a very dangerous game that's being played here by people who think they can control the beast that they're letting out the cage by people who think yeah. that by basically you know, stoking up the idea that we're all in our little hookies based on race, we're all in our little hookies based on uh, gender, um, and that they are the arbiters, that, that they decide. If they say there's something called blackness, they decide what blackness is. Um, they, they seem to be under the false assumption that they can control that beast once it's out of the cage. Yeah. The other thing that really annoys me, and maybe you can, can attest to this, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming here, yeah, is there's also a flat-out refusal to allow individuals to self-identify in a way in which they, they feel who they are. Let me be precise and specific. I self-identify as a Zulu Jewish um, individual who is 
a part and parcel of this country who has a deep, deep, deep love for faith, flag, family, and freedom. That's who I am. That's, 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 the, that's the, 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 the be-all to the end-all of who I am. If anything, I'm also a, 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 um, a, a, a second-class ghetto gentleman, if I can put it that way, because I'm proud of the township <laughs> I grew up in. But the, yeah. they would refuse me self-identifying in this way because I don't use the, the, the metric they want, which is black. Because black, in their view, yeah. comes with certain loaded things. Oh, he's a victim, number one. Yeah. Because he's a victim, these are the things he must demand out of society. These are the things that he's entitled to, etc., etc. I can't, for example, with my skin color and how they view me, I can't be a proud Zulu and say, no, I come from a people who are a... Hey, man, I come from warrior stock. Zulus, we're, we're not, uh, you know... <laughs> We're not just, um, you know, we, we're a very proud people. We are conquest and a conquering people. I can't appropriate that identity for myself, that cultural, mostly cultural identity, because in the, in the view of blackness, I must be a victim in their eyes. And be like, I don't know what your experience has been. I don't know how you self-identify, but what's your experience been, brother? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. I think... This is the problem that co all collectivists run into. Like as soon as you try and define, like you know, the the complexity of individual identity into one neat little box, then I think you are bound to fail. I mean, I think it's possible that you can be, for example, uh, a member of the ANC and uh, and the, uh, and the someone who's strongly in favor of gun rights, yes. even though that party is actively undermining those rights. And so this is this is the complexity of individual identities. And I think. Uh, South African politics have, have broadly acknowledged that in the past, I think the ANC is trying to uh, uh, impose a hegemonic identity, which I don't think will, will work well in the long run. So they, they, are, they are bound to fail on that. But uh, otherwise, I don't, I don't, uh, you, you can't, I, I don't, I, my identity, I, I, it shifts, it varies, it, it, it depends on how I wake up feeling in the morning. Sometimes I'm proud to be Zulu. Sometimes I'm like, oh man, like, you know, the, but, uh, 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 the Unchengwa really had the bad strategy at Sandran. I mean, like, how can you, how can you waste such a good, a good army attacking the British head on when you, you know, things like that. So, like, it, it, it varies for me. Like, it depends. Like, it, it, yeah. Guys, I, I must wrap up, but before I do that, Sorry. I was going to come back to you just now, Gabriel, uh, uh, but with a question, before I forget it, um, but from Dylan Thatcher. Just, Gabriel, I want to come to you with this one. Um, who exactly is stopping these elite schools writing a big fat check to whatever BE, ch BE charity they like? Um, I don't fully understand the context, but maybe take, take this question no, and, and make I a like, comment. I, lo I love that question. I love that question. Ten, ten, ten points to Gryffindor or whoever asked that question. <laughs> Dylan Thatcher, shout out to you, this, Dylan. Dylan, this is the rub. This is the rub. These guys in charge of these schools, and it's many schools across the country that I've read, including my own alma mater. Oh, they're very, very worried about transformation. They're very, very worried about uh, uh, uplifting blackness, right? So they're going to do many things. They're going to uh, have classes for the kids. They're going to um, uh, reconstitute the quota system for leadership, promote uh, to deputy headmaster or headmaster black people and so on. But these are performative aspects. These are esteem games. These are what most people call virtue signaling. Mm. When it comes to the real rub, when it comes to dollars and cents, rands and cents, the, where the real power of, uh, of a private institution is, is in its wealth, I don't see a lot of walk the walk. I don't see a lot of real uh, engagement uh, uh, it, at this time. I'm not saying historically there hasn't been. For example, at St. Stithians, one of the things I was very proud to see when I went to visit that school uh, on my 10th anniversary was that they'd set up a system that had already been going when I was at school in the 2000s of getting poor black kids, predominantly black, uh, kids who, who, who go to poorly run government schools, uh, to come in on Saturdays and to have uh, extra lessons provided to them for free, busing for free, lunch for free, and for teachers to come in and watch the teaching so that the teachers can also get trained. That's walking the walk. It costs resources. It costs time. It's a headache. There's a lot of management involved. And that's the real deal. But that's, uh, that's hard work, you know. 
Yeah. And and for a school like Hilton or Michael House or, or Bishops to take its endowment of let's say 100 million rand or or, or billion rand whatever it is and say 10% of it we're going to give to uh, some company that has proven itself capable of turning bad schools into good schools in poor areas we're going to do that because that's going to be our way of doing it that would be walking the walk but these guys are not walking the walk. And it's, again, like America in Washington, D.C., they've just painted Black Lives Matter in, in, in letters so high on the streets going up to the White House that you can sort of see it from out of space. It goes three blocks long. Black Lives Matter. Each word gets a block. What was the response from the Black Lives Matter movement? Screw you. We don't want letters on the streets. We want uh, what we want. We want you to walk the walk. Now, their ideas, I don't think, are good solutions. They want to defund the police and so on. But there is this inclination. Because so much of this is coming from an esteem situation, rather than a thinking about real values, people's real chances of, of becoming property owners, people's real chances of being abused by the police or not being abused by the police, or being abused by other criminals, it's rather just like a game of how do I look cool, how do I look like I'm hip with a fashion. Many of the solutions that are proposed are just hip with a fashion, and it's and it and there's and there's a latent hypocrisy there mm. that I, that that's extremely frustrating. Absolutely, yeah. guys. I'm, I must wrap up. We've run out of time, um, but to your point, when uh, Gabriel, I, I agree because if you also read some of the demands that are made in this, there's clearly someone who's looking to be a beneficiary um, from mm. this. You'll notice there's some demands that say something like, oh, no, no, no. They'll say, don't do this in-house. It must be done uh, externally. I'm of mm. the view that it is the grievance merchants, the people who come from these the, mostly spaces of academia, um, steeped in the language of you know race, class, and identity, who are mm. basically looking out for this and going, hmm, there's some endowments here. We can, we can cash in, <laughs> chief, uh, by becoming yeah. the, the diversity yeah. coordinator at these schools or any of yeah. these trashy little labels guys i must give you the final word and how people can find you on social media gabriel i'll begin with you how do we find you on social media brother oh you can't find me on social media find me on the daily friend i think the daily friend is one of the most exciting uh platforms in south africa it is run by the institute of race relations whom i work for so you know take it with a pinch of salt i'm i'm also inclined to toot my own horn or toot my own identity one of my identities <laughs> is a very loyal member of the IRR. But I like the, the Daily Friend. You'll see my work there. You'll see Mpiaki's work there. You'll see a lot of great writers work there. Uh, check it out. Absolutely. That's www.dailyfriend.co.za. I'll put that in the comments just now. Mpiaki, uh, <laughs> I know you're banned on Facebook. <laughs> I don't know if you're banned. <laughs> Have you been banned? Oh, my God. Yeah, I've been banned permanently. <laughs> Damn, that's some funny stuff. Maybe you should play the, the black card and be like, oh, you see, Facebook banned me. They're, they're being racist. Um, uh. Yeah, it's racism. <laughs> you know what? I was like, yeah, it's their platform, whatever. Like, you know, it's like, uh... but yeah. But yeah, I mean, like, how, how do you... You should be honest for your own good, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I, I, on Twitter, it's at Turing underscore 1991. I mean, I just think I, you hear a lot of people like on the conservative side mostly saying, hey, Twitter is this cesspool and all of that. And then Twitter bans them. And then they say, hey, Twitter, how dare you ban me? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, yeah, yeah. It's Guys, thank you very much. A nice comment here coming through uh, from Kerry from Skalkvik. B.I.K. Gabriel, great interview and conversation. Thank you, gents. Interesting and entertainment. I must second that. Facts, uh, uh, chaps, thank you very much. And yes, um, uh, Gabriel does have his own podcast uh, that he co-hosts with uh, Ooh, uh, Nicholas Lorimer. It's called Two Crickets in a Thorn Tree. Shout out to the, you guys for that one. It's also on the Daily Friend platform. Guys, thank you very much for joining me on this one. Um, and I must quickly just say to those of you who are Patreon subscribers, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I super appreciate that. To you, Alistair Ross and Sebastian Moretti for your super chats over here. Guys, mwah, thank you. Much love to you guys. And remember, you can support the Institute of Race Relations by becoming a friend of the IRR. That is their crowdfunding campaign. Uh, you can sign up... Uh, I think as little as 90 rand a month on there. How do you do that, you're wondering? You can SMS your name to 32823. Uh, terms and conditions to apply. That SMS will cost you one rand. And you can sign up and support them. They're backing me, and I'd like you to back them. Uh, guys, thank you so much for watching. And remember, as I always say on the Big Daddy Liberty Show, um, as I...
<laughs> stole it out <laughs> of your bits. <laughs> what do you always say? Sis? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this one We're is on the edge of our seats. <laughs> this one is a major shout out to the lefties and the Blavity Blacks and social justice warrior whites that we're speaking about on the show. And a reminder to you, dear viewer, which is never trust a commie.